Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the late start. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people to join in and then we'll begin. So thank you for your patience. Good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it is now 10.05 Jamaican time, 11.05 Bahamian time. Thanks again for your patience. And we're gonna start now. And as other participants and students come on, we will admit them. Again, we just really appreciate everyone joining us today for our annual Heritage Month lecture about the history of John Kuno in the Bahamas. And we just appreciate everyone from Jamaica and the Bahamas joining us today. We have representatives from the Ministry of Culture in Bahamas, the Ministry of Culture in Jamaica, as well as students from Jamaica and the Bahamas today. So again, welcome, welcome everyone. And I am just now going to do very brief introductions of our moderator and our lovely and beautiful John Kunu. Miss is Arlene Ferguson. So to start off with um, Mr. David Brown. Mr. David Brown is, I mean, Mr. Brown's resume is long, 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 everyone. Um, but he worked at the Institute of Jamaica for many, many years. And he has published in all sorts of journals. And he is currently at the Ministry of um, culture, entertainment, gender, and sport. And for Mrs. Nash Ferguson, she holds a Bachelor of Degree Art in History from McMaster University in Canada. And she is a veteran educator. And she has served formally in the field of education for 24 years. Um, she has worked in positions at government high schools and at the College of the Bahamas and St. John's College. And she, of course, is the director of the museum in the Bahamas. Um, and we are just so grateful for her for joining us today. 
So, long, of course, you guys, if you need any more information or background on our uh, moderator and our speaker, please contact me. But because we've are, we're already a little bit behind, we're just going to jump right into it. And I'm going to hand over to David Brown and Mrs. Arlene Nash Ferguson. Thank you, guys. Well, good morning, colleagues. Um, good morning, Ms. Ferguson. I've never met a John Canoe before, <laughs> a real live living John Canoe. I was, I was quite, quite taken with the, with the title that you have taken onto yourself. And as I was discussing with, with Alexis, that um, does it mean that you practice John Canoe or you identify with almost like an ethnicity, which is even more, more interesting for me? Um, <clears throat> By way of, of my own um, interest in John Canoe, as a researcher at the African Caribbean Institute, which is a division of the Institute of Jamaica, for many years. And we did do field research on John Canoe, which sadly, Arlene, is what I think is a dying form now in Jamaica. Um, I had the occasion at one of our UNESCO meetings to meet up with your former Minister of Culture, and the UNESCO National um, Secretary General some years ago. Um, and they had actually, we had actually held discussions with trying to see if the African Caribbean Institute, where I was at the time, could come to the Bahamas to document, record, and see what this whole thing is about John Canoe in the Bahamas. <clears throat> For many of us who don't know, <clears throat> it's, it's the most spectacular thing that takes place in the Bahamas around Christmas Boxing Day, if I believe. Yes. Um, and of course, it's a period of preparation long before that. Um, I'm also not going to go much further into your own presentation to tell everyone that John Canoe is being in the Bahamas, is being nominated and considered for inscription to UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage um, elements, much like how reggae was inscribed in 2018 in Mauritius. Um, so just to put in context, <clears throat> John Canoe is one of those elements that combines what we call African retentions, the practices we got from Africa in terms of the music, the instruments, um, some of the sayings, some of the dances, and the guiding philosophy behind it. Some African communities use John Canoes and masquerades as cleansing mechanisms, mm -hmm. as, as to recycle um, a society as a celebratory mechanism, especially if it has its origins, not just in, in Africa, mostly West Africa, but also on the plantation system, where our forefathers used it as forms of expression, especially under strong oppression. So mm. there are many, many undertones for it. Um, I am sad to see that Jamaica's own practices are kind of dying down, but I'm very, 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 very happy that the Bahamas has institutionalized John Canoe to the extent that I know you all discussed with us today. So um, in a nutshell, I was trying to set the tone, but I'm very pleased and honored to meet a John Canoe. I mean, it still baffles my mind. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Brown, and good morning to everybody. It is such a privilege to be here. And I particularly liked your, your introduction because you talked about how we are so connected to John Canoe. And I must tell you a secret. In our audience this morning is a young lady. I always used to say, I am a John Canoe. And she put it on a shirt. I I'm John Canoe, and that is Angelique McKay. And so you certainly, you certainly, um, you certainly depicted us well. We are John Canoe, and it is an absolute privilege to be here. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to you and uh, Miss McDavid. I am honored to share a little bit about John Canoe in the Bahamas with you, just an overview to give you a feel of how entrenched it is and ingrained in our lives at this point. And so I am going to begin to share my screen um, because, you know, a picture is, I, I, would, I would appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to, to share my screen. 
um, so that I can share the PowerPoint uh, presentation with you. Sorry, Arlene. Alexis, I, I think you need to make her co-host so that she can do that. Are you seeing it, Mrs.? Yes, thank you. Are you seeing it now, Mrs. Nashford? No, I'm, st I'm still... I'm still seeing that I am disabled, that the host disabled me. Disabled participant screen sharing. <clears throat> Hold on, everyone. I thought I had enabled it. One second, please. Forgive me. No problem. Mrs. Nash Ferguson, try again now. Is it still blocking you? Okay. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. Good to go. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of Jean Canoe, what we call the spirit of the Bahamas. And I am so delighted to share a little bit with you about this uniquely Bahamian cultural phenomenon that really engages all of us in a big way. It is um, it has grown into a uniquely Bahamian phenomenon, and for that we are very, very, uh, we are very proud. And so, just before I begin, I would like to share with you a little bit about my country, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. We are an archipelago. We have 700 islands and key small islands in our our nation, and believe it or not, if that were not enough, we have 2,400 rocks. I don't know who counted them, but we will take their word for it. And if all of our islands were put together in one land mass, we would be the size of your island, the size of Jamaica. We are spread over 100,000 square miles of what we consider to be the most beautiful water in the world. And we stretch from just off the coast of Florida in the United States to just north of Cuba. That is where we are geographically located. And so in these islands, a strange thing happens. It's called Junkanoo. It's a strange thing with a strange name, and it makes us beat until we bleed. That's blood on that drum. It makes us work ourselves into a frenzy. It makes us dance until we drop, even if you are my age. It makes us keep the children up all night. We stay out in the rain, and if we need to, we will make up our bed on Bay Street. This is the power of Junkanoo. And when I talk about Bay Street, that is the main street on the island of New Providence, on which is situated the nation's capital of Nassau. And that is where the Junkanoo parades take place every Christmas night into Boxing Day. And every New Year's morning, it is a night festival. And this strange Junkanoo causes us every year in the modern Bahamas to come together by the hundreds. We spend hundreds of hours building shacks, 
the, the buildings where we make our costumes. Then we have to make our costumes. We make our musical instruments. We move hundreds of people in perfect formation in costume and making our own music from one end of Bay Street to the next. And we put on such a spectacular performance that the entire island stands up and cheers. We, Junkanoo has become the toast of the town. How did it start? Why are we getting up in the middle of the night? Why are we spending all year in these shacks to get ready for this parade, which with today, the parade, I call it my, our experience, our, it begins on the continent of Africa with specific reference to West Africa. Our African ancestors, as you know, we share a common history were brought to this, to the Western Hemisphere by force against their will. And they were, they were enslaved to create, the, to create the workforce that was needed in our part of the world. And so that is where our story begins. And, and you know the story well. We are captured in West Africa we are marched out to the coast in most instances. And when the slave ship arrives, we are packed into the hold of the ship. It was an experience that this beautiful day really lends the lie to. We cannot imagine the horror of being in the Bahamas, we would say yucked up, of being yucked up from your life, your regular life. And suddenly you are in chains and you are being dragged out to the coast and put on a vessel. Some of our ancestors had never seen the ocean before. Absolutely traumatic. And you are packed into the hold of a ship as if you are an animal, because that is what you were considered to be. And so the horror of the Middle Passage, which could sometimes take as long as three months, was a real experience, but we survived. The strength of our people, our ancestors, we survived the horror. And we read in some accounts, that the only physical thing we are permitted to bring with us on this voyage of horror, apart from what we treasured in our heart and what we treasured in our memories, was a goatskin drum. And the purpose of the goatskin drum was to keep the beat as we were forced to exercise, because although we are animals, we, they want us to be live animals because they want to sell us. It was all about money. And so in New Providence, the ship pulled up. If it, if it was coming to New Providence, it pulled up in Nassau Harbor. And the building is still there today where slaves were sold. It is today the... Uh, the Museum of Emancipation and Slavery to commemorate this chapter in our lives. You are sold, you are degraded, you're standing there and people are poking your body in various parts, checking your teeth and, and checking all your private parts to make sure you would make a good sale. And then you are auctioned off. And wherever it was you landed in the Bahamas, that is where your life of slavery began. So now here you are in a new country and no matter how beautiful, it was not your country. And so here you are in this new country, reduced to a life of slavery. You are a thing, your master owns you and your master owns whatever you produce and your master owns whatever issue comes from your body, your children. It was an unspeakable horror. But something started to happen. 
And it didn't happen only in the Bahamas, but we seem to have been the, the, the place where it really took deep root and it has not only survived, but it has flourished. And I tell children, we have no African voice in the Bahamas that tells the story. And so we must intuit what we believe our ancestors were thinking. And I believe they were thinking this. Okay, no separation between church and state. So even for slaves, you are are granted three days holiday at Christmas time. Three days, three big days. I believe our ancestors, their thinking went like this. So what will we do with these three days? Well, if we can escape, what's our next best option? Well, you know, these people have us classified as slaves. When the, uh, as animals, when the list, the inventory from the plantation goes to New Providence every year, we are listed right there with the sheep and the cows and the goats. We are animals. But we cannot be animals because when we were back in the mother country, we celebrated every rite of passage in the human experience. When the baby was born, when we named the baby, when a boy became a man, when somebody died, we cannot be animals because animals don't have rituals and ceremonies and festivals. And so we will use it. Only we will use these three days to remind, if only ourselves, that we are members of the human family. And we will do it by recreating our festivals from home. It's time to reclaim our spirits. And just in case anybody tries to stop us, we'll wait until the night and off we go. And we discover that although we were deliberately mixed by culture to make language more difficult and other things, most West African festivals give or take, but generally, let's say many of them have four things in common. We discover that we all use a goat skin drum, some kind of bell or rattle or shaker. You decorate yourself fully for your festival. And when you cover your face, it symbolizes the presence of the ancestors. And so research shows us that there are a number of West African uh, cultures that have similar practices to what has today become Jankunu and also similar names. And, you know, as Dr. Nicolette Bethel tells us, what the British thought they heard and what they heard could well have been two different things. And so we believe that Jankanu, the name um, originated not only from John Canoe, uh, a, a very distinguished young Bahamian um, says his name was John Quow. And of course, that is mixed in with the story. But that all that is a part of the story because there were so many different cultures with so many similar festivals. And of course, we know that the ceremonies were going on long before we were packed onto the ships. And so we steal away under cover of night to reclaim our souls. And we're in the bush in Nassau. And we know how to make a goatskin drum. We need a bell. Well, we are in, uh, we're on a farm. There goes that cow, grab that bell from around his neck and be good to go. And for our decorations, initially, we're using plant leaves. We're using sponge, so plentiful in the waters of the Bahamas. We're using anything indigenous. And I tell the children, we'll never know for sure. But I believe that one day, some 
something might have floated out of the master's window and you looked around furtively and you picked it up and you tucked it away and ran off to your hut and pushed it under the straw mat that you slept on because you were not supposed to have it. And that's what you brought out at Christmas time to decorate yourself with as a mark of defiance. And they ask me if it is gold, is it silver? I tell them, no, it was paper. Because by law, you are not permitted to learn to read and write. You stick that paper on. And so we have our drum, we have our bell, and we have our decoration. And down through the years we came until after emancipation, the celebration at Christmas time evolved into sporadic all over the place, no plan, nothing, just at Christmas time, people took to the streets and had a wonderful time. And so that the powers that be in 1899, they passed the Street Nuisances Prohibition Act, which limited Junkanoo times to Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, and then again on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And that was the root of the celebration that we, uh, that was the kind of structuring of the, of the um, um, all over the place celebration that John Kunu had started as. The evening parades were poorly subscribed. And so eventually John Kunu moved to four o'clock in the morning, um, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. In 1938, the religious leaders complained about the ruckus happening on, they said, and the Savior's birthday. And so Boxing Day was made a public holiday and Christmas and the Christmas parade was moved to Boxing Day. And so that set the stage for modern day Junkanoo. And down through the years, we came. Shaking our bells, beating our drums, sticking paper onto our clothes. And then we come to what I call the modern era. Riots in Nassau 1942, all street parading is banned. 1948, Jean was back to Bay Street after the six-year ban. And from then until now, through the years, we have seen the participation and group size increase. We now have bleachers. People are able to purchase a seat to sit we have barricades that separate the performers, the junkanoos, from those who are viewing the parade. The costumes have become larger and more elaborate. In the 1970s, one group brought out brass instruments, and they have been on the parade from then till now. And over the years, the route has expanded to accommodate the increase in people participating. Apart from the two major parades, we also have street parades at Easter time, Bahamian Labor Day, first Friday in June, Independence Day, July the 10th, and Emancipation Day, of course, the first Monday in August. And so that sets the stage for modern day Junkanoo. And it is, as Mr. Brown said, it engages us in a normal year for the greater part of a calendar year. We come off the parade from the New Year's, uh, from New Year's, we may give ourselves a month to rest, but even then we are thinking about themes for the upcoming parades. And so the process starts. And this is what a modern day Junkanoo group must do today, voluntarily. We organize at least 400 people from every walk of life and all ages. We must find all of the materials to make our own costumes. We make our own costumes. We make our own music as well as our instruments. We have to build our shacks to put our costumes in. And so we manage for I always say if it's 400 people, we're talking about 800 different personalities and they are all, by and large, they are all volunteers and they do this big job and they are not paid. And on top of all of that, we produce a world-class product 
and we meet our deadline every year. There's, there's something called Bahamian time. This is not it. This is, we are there when the whistle blows, we are lined up and we are ready to go. And so how does this happen? This is the process um, of what I call the Junkanoo cycle. The first thing we always do, we have to review the past parades and we look at where we fell down, we look at where we were successful, we get ready to go. We organize our group who is going to do what, what shacks are we going to use, all of these things. Then we have to choose a theme. We are choosing a theme um, that will govern your, perform your, your presentation. And of course, you can't wear this. It's not the same theme, Christmas and New Year's. We are preparing for two parades that will fall within the space of a week. So you're choosing a theme and your theme must be rich enough and flexible enough to accommodate at least 100 different designs. And then we go into the shack. This is what the shack looks like in the back of my yard. You go into the shack and you batten down and you get ready to roll. And then, of course, I'll come to the music um, 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 in just a moment. But in the shack, the magic is happening. We are scavenging cardboard from the brewery and from the furniture stores discarded material that other people throw away and we drag it back to the shack and the magic begins. In many cases, you will see a sketch like the one in the upper left-hand corner. There's an art, an artist will draw what the costume is supposed to look like. And that now has to be translated into a three-dimensional costume that you will get to dance in. And so the cardboard is laid out flat on the floor and he has the design there that he is following, and he now has to figure out how he is going to do that. Sorry. And then you have to cut out the cardboard shapes. And then we are going to assemble the cardboard shapes and start to make the costumes take shape. The upper left-hand corner, this is what a very busy shack looks like. You have costumes still in cardboard mode. You have costumes that have been painted white because we want the designs, the colors to really jump out. And so we paint the brown cardboard white. And then the artist, somebody else comes along. Very few costumes are done by one person. It's a wonderful exercise in teamwork. We'll come and put the lines on them. You see in the upper, in the lower left hand corner, put the design in, and in each space, there's an initial that tells the paster what color is to go in there. And then the pasters go to work. We're using crepe paper in a variety of, in very tiny strips, we call it fringing, we call it pasting, you must apply that to the costume. And so now we start to see the magic starts to take shape in the shack. And we are, and the lower, in the lower right-hand corner, you see once the color goes on, uh, the costumes start to take shape. And so there is a lot of activity and we are going to be locked down in those shacks for months and people will, will call some young men lazy and they're not interested in anything, you get them into a shack. And you have never seen such work application. You've never seen such industry, such dedication just to be on a parade for a few hours. And a part of what drives that, that energy is the music of Junkanoo. We have stayed true to our to our um, history and the goatskin drums and the cowbells remain the main instruments of Junkanoo today, although we have added this as well. And so we have traditionally either nailed or screwed our drum heads onto the cylinder of the drum. And so for you to for you to tighten your drum head, you must expose it to extreme heat. And so this is a photograph 
of the drums around the fire. They will put them on the fire roughly an hour or so before the parade or the practice, the rehearsal starts. And they will get hot and they will get very taut and you will be able to beat them, um, um, say, for probably uh, an hour as well before you have to heat them again. And so what you find happening in the Bahamas in a normal year is that come September, when schools open, the jungle new season opens, whether officially or unofficially, and every week, Junkanoo groups practice and it has become the social event of the season. Of course, COVID has rained on our parade, but this is what happens in a normal year. And you are getting your costume ready. You're getting your dance steps ready. You are getting your music ready. And we are galvanized um, um, to produce this world-class festival that will engage everybody. And then comes the big morning. There are so many people on the parade now the parade time has been pushed forward to 10 o'clock christmas night and so bay street and the downtown area all the surrounding streets littered with magnificent costumes all made from paper one strip at a time incredible um and many of us who are not artists, oh man, when it comes to us looking beautiful on the parade, believe me, we are artists. And so it's time to line up. And we find ourselves down there. We are lining up in order and we are ready to go behind your banner, which tells you what the, 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 the name of your group is and your theme, come the dancers. These are off the shoulder dancers. Every dancer tells a different uh, aspect of the overall group theme. And no wheels, we are dancing. This is a dancing parade. And we want to ensure that everybody is fully equipped and ready to roll. Behind the dancers come the choreographed dancers. They, they learned a routine. And so they are dancing in routine. And one of the things about Junkanoo that so touches me is that it does not matter who you are. What you are judged on out there is the beauty and the excellence of your costume. You could be a straw vendor. You could be the prime minister of the Bahamas. And we have we have had five prime ministers since independence and three have been on the parade um, in costume while holding office. It does not matter. You can be an accountant in a hotel. You can be the housekeeper in the hotel. Once you get out there, all of we is, 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 is Bahamian and we are ready. To roll. I could remember, just as an aside, I could remember when I was offered the position of principal of my former school, where I had actually been a student, I was told that I would have to stop rushing, we call it rushing. And I thanked, I thanked the person and I said, well, in that case, I will stay as vice principal. And they relented because to me, that would have sent the exact opposite message from what I was trying to convey, which is that Junkanoo is for everybody. If because I'm principal, I'm too good or too high to be out there, then uh, no, that's not the right message. And so behind the choreograph girls come the music. And as I said, the brass was introduced in the 1970 brass instruments. And we also have what we call black horns that we are blowing as well. Notice everybody is elaborately costumed and this is the way it goes. And then behind there come the, the bellows, the people shaking the cowbells. And we are making these in the Bahamas locally. We are calling, we are affectionately still calling them cowbells, but no self-respecting cow will be caught dead wearing these bells. These are for partying and these are for having a wonderful time. And so the bellers take great pride in their costumes. And over the years, they have gotten larger and larger and larger. And then the bells are around the drummers. On the right, you have a bass drum that's made out of cow skin. On the left, you have what they call a tum-tum. It's a tom-tom drum off the drum set. And you will find some drummers will use it because they don't need to stop to, to heat up. 
And so that's a little cheating going on there, but it's become a part of it. And so this drama engages the people of the Bahamas and we um, we can't wait for it. And we bring our children. This is me, one Junkanoo morning with my granddaughter right in front of me. Her little brother is right in front of is right in front of her. And it is a tradition that we are determined to pass on to our children. One of the first gifts that little boys get in the Bahamas in particular is a little tiny goat skin, goat skin drum. And so because we want to pass it on to our children, there is a separate junior Junkanoo parade. And that takes place either at the beginning of December or the last time we had it, it took place at the end of January. And this is organized by schools. And so we have the preschool division, primary, we have the junior high and the senior high, and then there's a division there for community groups. And so the children get out there and they do what it is um, we feel that they were born to do. And so when it comes to children, just as an aside here, as an educator, it occurred to me that Junkanoo is very rich um, for exploitation in terms of education. It makes a wonderful unit of inquiry. What I have done with this chart, and I'm not going to stay on this too long, the pink boxes on the outside of the chart, starting from up here, the pink boxes, they trace the process that we follow to get to the parades as Junkanoos. And I have tied every step in with a discipline in the school curriculum. And so that is something that we are hoping that that will soon come to fruition. And we, um, you know, it's, a, it's another part of the process of indigenizing education. And we are certainly pushing for that. And so I wanted to make sure that our children get this rich experience, even if abbreviated, um, just to be exposed to the rich history of Junkanoo and to see it as more than a parade and a competition. And so I decided the old people in Junkanoo, we always say, go with what you got. And so to make my dream come true, all I had was the house that I grew up in. And that is what I converted into a museum, the Edu Culture Junkanoo Museum. Sometimes I call it the Junkanoo Museum. But Edu Culture, that word is a combination of my twin passions of education and culture. And so never be afraid to follow your dream, even as unlikely as it may seem, um, um, it's going to happen. So I put a Junkanoo Museum in my house, in my old, um, my childhood home, and the children come there to learn about Junkanoo. And before they even touch a piece of paper, they hear the story, they view the exhibits, and then we go into the shack. Like I tell them, the shack is in the back of your yard and we closed in what used to be the back patio. So they step out of the door of the house onto the back patio, which is now a shack. And it's set up like a classroom. And they now, um, they learn to put the paper on and we're talking to them about Junkanoo and various aspects of the festival. And when their hats are done, they are all proudly showing them off. And then they get to use their drums and their cowbells. And we make sure that they are exposed to this beautiful uh, Bahamian experience. And we carry this experience just to give you an idea of how widespread, I mean, Junkanoo is just endemic in the Bahamas. And so we carry this experience into hotels for visitors when we are asked and they make their hats and they do the music. We have visitors who, are, who come to the Junkanoo Museum and they try on the hats on display there. And then we've also done the Junkanoo Land summer camp during the summer and the children make their own costumes. And then we go on Bay Street for the Independence Parade. 
We have, we have taken Jean-Claude to birthday parties. When Joshua turned four, his grandmother said, we're having a Jean-Claude birthday party. And we set up a shack there and all of his little friends were able to make their little hats and dance around and have one wonderful time. Our ministry in the upper left-hand corner, our ministry of, of, of tourism every year does a Junkanoo Summer Festival, and we take our museum down there for our visitors to get a taste of it. We've gone into hotels and put up displays for special events, and believe it or not, we even have Junkanoo weddings. And this one was magnificent, right on Bay Street in the heart of the capital and the bride had on a beautiful Jean-Canu headpiece and how her, her train was pasted. It's all paper and and all of the attendants were in full Jean-Canu costume, just magnificent. And the other part of the story, we also have Jean-Canu funerals. If you are a Jean-Canu and you pass away, we are going to pay tribute to you in the way we know how best. And so there will be a banner with your with 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 the information on it. And some people will show up in full Jankanoo costume. In this case, this was the funeral of, of, of a Bahamian legend and icon, John Chippy Chipman. And he always he made the goat skin drums and his casket, if you notice, was covered with with with, with goat skin. And so this is what happens in the Bahamas. Jankanoo has been on the on, on the Bahamas customs inspection sticker, you come through, um, you come through customs, and if all is well, they stamp a junk a junk new sticker onto your bag. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I have given you just a taste of this strange thing that grips the people of the Bahamas, junk new, and. As I said, I always tell the children when we say, let's go to bay, that is the rally cry for Junkanoos. Um, that means we are getting ready for the parade. And when the children at the museum ask me, are we going to Bay Street? And no, 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 no. We'll use it as an acronym. As an acronym. It means beyond and above yesterday. Every single day, you must be better than you were the day before. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is that is what I that is what I wanted to share with you this morning. And I thank you so much for listening to me. I am not sure whether or not we will, um, I'm not sure whether or not we will be permitted questions, but I thank you for 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 for, for listening to me. Thank you, Arlene. That was quite an interesting um, presentation. I mean, I learned quite a lot about the ins and outs of the John Canoe there in the Bahamas. Thank you. Yes, we will open the floor to questions, but I just wanted to give a recap of the main points and to throw out some, some of my own questions mm -hmm. um, that will probably spark um, additional um, discussion. Mm -hmm. First thing is that, and I know everyone May have that question is how the word John Canoe is spelt. And <laughs> in Jamaica, you have variations of J O H N C A N O E, as in John Canoe. Canoe, or, right. Yes, or John Canoe, like how oh, you have it. How did the Bahamas come up with that particular spelling and how did it stick? That is. Is, that is a wonderful example of how we love to contract words. <laughs> when, when my mother always called it the Johnny Canoes. Um, but by the time as we got to the 1950s, by the time as we got past 1948 and into the 1950s, it was becoming known more frequently as John Canoe. And so that is a Bahamian contraction of John Canoe. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's spelled J-U-N-K-A-N-O-O. -O. Uh, we, we had a very prominent musician some years ago. His name was Dr. Off. He was a notorious junkanoo. And he looked at that word and he said, you know, this is what 
it is. We take junk and we make it new. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, yes, but it's it's junk new, yes. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to point out was that when I was listening to your presentation, for those of us who want a greater sense of how widespread John Canoe is, mm -hmm. remember it's not just in Jamaica or in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. um, because historical records have mentioned John Canoe taking place even in the United States, right. in, in North Carolina as early as 1824. Right. Um, and even in another celebration in, in, in Virginia, in Suffolk, Virginia. So, but if you think about it, this is where populations of enslaved Africans really lived. Right. Um, hence where the expression itself would have survived. Uh, there must be some reason why the Bahamas tradition has enjoyed such a strong level of retention. As yes. Opposed to other places. Um, could, you, could you in a nutshell tell us what you think those reasons are? Why has John Kino become so entrenched then, for want of a better word, in the Bahamas and is really dying out in places so near to it like Jamaica? Yes, that that is a fascinating question. Shankunu, as you as you say, has been documented in the Carolinas. Uh, you said the 1820s or 30s, I think. Our earliest documentation is 1801 in the Bahamas. But it yeah. has been documented, as you say, Jamaica um, still has a remnant. Uh, Belize, uh, one or two, uh, several, you know, not several, but one or two places. And so, but usually in British usually in former British territories, because of course, as you know, in Roman Catholic countries, the great celebration was always right before Lent, before the period of fasting leading up to Easter. And, and, and the Christmas festivals were all, were, were, were all documented in former British territories. Now, why we kept going and it started to die out everywhere else i am not absolutely sure something took root here that made it a compulsion that's the only way i can explain it to you that made it a compulsion and we have whether we have done it deliberately or not we have done a good job of inculcating that um to our children and so, and so I can't give any scientific evidence as to why it is so widespread in the Bahamas. All I know is that in my soul, if you see we are not, uh, we don't hear those drums and bells for too long, we start to suffer withdrawal <laughs> as we started to do, as we started to do with COVID, because of course we haven't had friends now. Yeah. And so, but, but what is interesting is this. We have not had formal parades, but you know where, where, why the drums have kept beating? The Junkanoo funerals have continued. They have continued. If a Junkanoo passes away, the drums will start beating and the bells will start ringing. That, it, it just has not died, per se. And it will not die, but 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 if I find out why, we, why it has grown here and nowhere else, I'll let you know. Okay. My third observation is this, Arlene, that you mentioned on more than one occasion in your presentation a kind of a stigma associated mm -hmm. with practice. Mm -hmm. um, you referenced the noise nuisance laws in the early 1880s. <laughs> and I think so much now about what Jamaica has here now for dance hall, the Noise Abatement Act. The very name of the act itself is discriminatory calling dance hall and expression of the people as noise, you know? And the same thing applies to John Canoe as noise, a noise nuisance. And then you referenced when you were being offered the position of a principal mm -hmm. to a school that the conditionality that was attached was that you had to stop, what's the term you use, rushing? Rushing, yes. Yeah, so you basically had to give up John Canoe if you were to become the principal. That's yes, that was that. Yeah. Yes, and that. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So that was what was being basically implied. And my thing is this: 
is it that once you become or attain a certain status, you shouldn't be associated with something that seems to be low, based, derogatory, lesser yeah. than, you know what I mean? And it's, yes. it's a shame if that really is the case. So how does, how do you, but as you, I mean, have we ever thought about how do we reconcile celebrating an, an, an element, a practice like John Canoe every year? The government funds it quite a significant amount. It's part of the identity of, of the country. But yet, <laughs> if you were to attain a certain position within, a, within the service or so, you'd have to almost disassociate yourself from it. It's quite a contradiction. Yes, and, and thank you so much. Well, let me put it into a time frame because I was approached to become principal in 1988. And I would like to think that that has changed now. And, okay. and, and one of, it has really changed. When I was a little girl and I wanted to rush, uh, it was considered infradig and something that not good people did from certain classes. This was the perception. But because my uncle was on the committee, my mother and those allowed me to go out with him. They thought it was cute, but it was not accepted. And particularly for females at that time, this would have been the 50s because I was born in 1950. This would have been in the, in the 50s. But I, uh, I would like to think, and I know that we have changed that over the years. And one of the people who was instrumental in changing that was the first prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Sir Lyndon Oscar Pindling. Sir mm. Lyndon stood up, he was opening an exhibition on Junkanu at the Department of Archives. And he stood up in his speech and he said, I am a Junkanu. And uh. he wrapped that up that Christmas by being on the parade in costume. And that, I think, in many ways, might, might, might not have been the only thing, but that helped to unleash the floodgates because students coming back home now, everybody jumped in the street. And, and so now today, you it's not unusual to see the prime minister out there. Everybody is out there, government ministers, you have a priest who are out there. It, I, I would like to think that we have dispelled that. That class thing, I would like to think, is completely gone now. Okay, that's nice to hear. Well, all right, mm -hmm. I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, please feel free to uh, by a show of hands. Um, and um, either Arlene or myself would be more than happy to respond. I know we're under a time limit, so... Um, please make your comments very succinct and direct. I had a question um, for Mrs. Nash Ferguson. Um, I was able to watch um, that amazing um, segment on BBC Travel Show that was aired this year that featured yourself um, and talking about John Kono in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you kind of briefly touched on it about how you've been able to adapt for COVID. Can you just tell um, our audience who were not able to watch that segment like myself um, a little bit more about how you adapted for COVID? Yes, thank you. I think I described Jankunu as being um, um, the story itself of resilience. Um, as I had mentioned before, we are a beautiful country, no two ways about it. I cannot tell a lie. The Bahamas truly, we, we consider ourselves to be blessed. But living here has not always been easy. Um, and we have had to adapt to some very difficult circumstances. And, and I think Junkanoo is an example of that. Who celebrates, who re-engages their rituals and their ceremonies when you are enslaved? I mean, what causes your spirit to continue to flourish in the midst of this horror? And I think what we see in John Canoe, we see replicated in, in, and throughout the Bahamas and our approach 
to on our approach to these things. And so I think it's the spirit of resilience that we see in Jungle. That's the same spirit that caused us to look. And I'm sure it happens in Jamaica. We looked into the bush and we created a pharmacology to heal ourselves. We were just determined to survive. And I think Jankanu is an excellent example of that. And I'll tell you something that gave me goosebumps. A lot of young people perhaps may not know the story that I told you, but what I found strange was that when the shacks opened at the beginning of the season and these young men from all walks of life, they walk into the shack and the excitement is bubbling because we get ready to go back to bay. And they don't say, I come to get my costume. They said, I come to get me. And that is what I named my book because I found that to be so profound. They did not know that their ancestors had gone in the bush and used what we call Junkanoo to reclaim their spirit, to reclaim their souls, to reclaim themselves. And here are these young men 200 years later reenacting that ritual in their modern way. But they're saying, I come to get me. It, it gives me goosebumps to this day. And so it's a deep-seated re resilience that really was born of necessity. We had no choice. We had to survive. And so, Ms. McDavid, I hope I have answered your question. That is the best that that is the best that I can do. Jungle itself is resilient. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. I see Rodna has her hand up. I will be quick because I am at home and I have other persons around, but I just want to comment being born in the 80s and growing up through John Canoe, that I agree totally with Ms. Ferguson Nash that it has changed growing up. I remember there were some, it was uh, still considered a bit not for females to be a part of John Canoe. And as time has progressed, it has, that has dispelled, that has dispersed. Everyone who is anyone, if they're not personally in John Canoe, I myself, I have relatives they're in John Canoe and it's still, a, it's still a competitive nature. Even if you don't participate, you are, I'm from Mason's edition. So she would understand that that area itself is, is <laughs> and across the street is a one family. And a, and family. Down, you know, so we, we, we are John Canoe. John Canoe is who we are. And um, COVID-19 <laughs> has been hard for many John Canoeers because that's a part of their identity. So they look forward to it. They come. They they that, that's togetherness for a lot, a lot of people, and people make contacts. Their, their contacts are through John Canoe. Their brotherhoods is through John Canoe. You may be a janitor to work, but in the shack, you are senior man to someone else who is probably the president or CEO of their of their company. So I just want to comment. I cannot stay much longer, but I'm glad. I'm, I really appreciated this. This meeting was wonderful. I, I think Educulture, and I've already posted that to my Facebook page, Educulture is a wonderful idea, and I'm looking forward to seeing more and more. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Rodna. Thank you. Fun. Thank you so much. And you know, the point, Rodna, the point Rodna made about, about the, uh, identity, she used the word identity. You know, you will pass a group of fellas walking down the road, making noise, talking loud, maybe bouncing a basketball or whatever it is they are doing. And they are just, uh, you know, there's nothing to celebrate. There's nothing remarkable. But man, listen here. They might be insignificant for the whole year, but when they get on that parade in their costumes and the whole country is looking at them and celebrating them, she is absolutely right. It is a matter of, of identity. All of a sudden, you are not invisible anymore. You are what we call here a big dog, and that is, that is a big thing. I see Miss Farrington has her hand up as well. I'm sorry, I don't know the first name. Good afternoon, Colleen Farrington. Um, hey, I Colleen. Have, hello. I have a question for you, um, Mrs. Ferguson, and piggybacking off of what Rodna said. And you know, I'm coming from 
you know just where I'm going to come from, education. Um, yes, you ma'am. spoke of the, the, the stigma and how it has broken down in society. Mm -hmm. um, as an educator, I'm in here. Some of my students are in here, fourth grade. And Beautiful. there's another educator in here as well. Um, how do we get that same, what do you think would be the approach? Because we're not seeing that same stride in education. We still <laughs> have that stigma where with John Kunu, like Junior John Kunu in particular, we've seen a decline when the country was open in New Providence schools participating. Um, Levarity Cooper can um, attest to this. I, as a coordinator, can say it's always a fight. You mm -hmm. have to convince the schools and district principals that, you know, this is good for the students. And then if you do get to go, it's as though the students who are not so academically inclined, um, John Kunu is for the students, you know, those that the marginalized students, the ones who give problems, the ones who have issues, that's who it, it, it's supposed to be for. So that stigma seems to be so entrenched in education in our schools, which I mean, for me is so disturbing because this is our culture and education is a way to pass down culture. But for some reason, John Kunu is just being pushed to the side, even in our mm -hmm. textbooks and our workbooks, maybe a page or two. So how do we get there where we are going to have this same, where we have this same breakdown, this change in mindset mm -hmm. at how mm -hmm. John Kunu is looked at in academia? Because as I listened to your presentation and um, the thought came to me, you can't tell the story of the Bahamas of Bahamian history without mm -hmm. John Canoe. Mm -hmm. They are one and the same. Mm -hmm. How do we get this message to the min our Ministry of Education to understand this is our history. It's mm -hmm. not just about the parade, it's not noise, it's not rushing. How do mm -hmm. we get that part where it's mm -hmm. in schools, not just something mentioned, but we're teaching it. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get break this wall down? Well, that is an excellent question. And before I answer, let me just congratulate you again publicly on your Junkanoo math parade that you did at your school. It was absolutely too creative and too and and and, and just just beautiful. Congratulations. Well, um, you. This is what I would say. You are in this room. So is Angelique. So is Sadira. We are all teachers. And I think we need to make a commitment right here and now that we are going to get together. I believe what John Ruskin said. If it's to be, it's up to me. If we, we have to present a proposal that, and we've done the groundwork already, well thought out powerful that shows the link between Jankunu and education and the benefits of it to our, for our children. And so and so ladies, I will be calling you and we if we are serious, we um we can begin to put together our proposal and then we will see where it go from goes from there. But let us begin by making a presentation to the minister of of, of education who now is a female. So here's hoping not to say that makes a difference, but here's hoping that, 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 that we can make some groundwork and at least get approval to proceed. And so if you all are, are willing, I am quite willing for us to meet and get to work. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I am on board 100%. Yeah, you, you talk yourself right into plenty work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Sadira Livarity Cooper having have her hand up. Um, I don't know if you have a, a comment or an intervention. I, I, um, I, good afternoon, everyone. I am happy to be invited by Colleen. And as she said, as passionate educators, and I would have been a participant of John Canoe from a little girl. It, it is very true what she is saying. And I, it has impacted my life in such a way that I was so proud to be privileged and a part of, of being exposed culturally through mm -hmm. participating as a little girl. And so it is important for us to share 
and continue to cultivate and, and share this with our children. Mm. Mm -hmm. they, would, they would be missing out if they are not exposed mm -hmm. culturally to Jankanu mm -hmm. as our culture. And so much Amen. that comes with it, organization, time, skills, the artwork, it's so much that is built into it and definitely should be a part of our classrooms and, and the integration with Colleen and math. It should mm. be a part of all our lives from children. Mm -hmm. That's an important part of the process, Doralene. And I go again, I reference again the um, nomination for UNESCO inscription mm -hmm. as a main part of it um, that would support the inscription is the fact that, as you mentioned, each year um, children have their own John Canoe. And even outside of that, they themselves are allowed to view, to see, to participate in some other aspect of the quote unquote adult John Canoe. It's something that allows a tradition to be passed on from generation to generation. So <laughs> your grandparents, your grandfather, your grandmother did an aspect of it. You would come up probably doing a costume or learning to play a drum, this kind of thing. Um, so the tradition is being safeguarded through that transmission process. Um, not just because the practice itself is, is continuing, but also because, as you mentioned, aspects of it are being incorporated <coughs> in the educational system. Still more room and work to be done there, but it's actually <laughs> being now facilitated by that rather than being shunned if it were under, say, a kind of a... Yes post-colonial kind of narrative that says that these things are bad and not to be done and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. I wanted to commend you and your colleagues, and who all of whom sound like teachers, <laughs> by the way, um, for the work that they're doing in safeguarding that tradition. Now, if we have, yes. um, we have time, I believe, for one final question or comment. I remember... Um, Sadira had said, was it Sadira or, or Carlene had said that there was a student on, 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 the, on this call? I don't know if they had a comment or an observation they wanted to make. I doubt they're going to speak. They'll probably ask me in class. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, then, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, um, I know Alexis will do her thank her, but um, Arlene? I want to thank you because I have personally been enriched by this. Um, I think we need to probably arrange opportunities where the Ministry of Culture here in Jamaica can participate either through observation, documentation, or even a sharing of expertise of how we safeguard intangible cultural heritage elements such as John Canoe. Um, and we certainly, as I said before, have a need for the kind of um, capacity development that you have been doing over the years to safeguard the longevity of John Canoe. We're in Jamaica, mm -hmm. it's now a dying um, practice. So there is clearly mm -hmm. some room for negotiation and discussion. And I hope outside of this, you and I, uh, through Alexis, can continue this kind of discussion. Um, and if you still, if you still insist, Arlene, on sending me to come to, to John Canoe in, in December, I, I, have, I have no objections. <laughs> and I will I'm inviting myself. Yes. Thank you. I have no shame. You, but... I'm <laughs> no shame whatsoever. And, and it doesn't look as if anything will happen this year, but I will keep you all posted. <laughs> and right. I thank you so much for, 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 for your hospitality. Truly, it has been a pleasure. <laughs> I see oh, Angelique. Angelique has a comment, sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I just didn't want us to sign out without um, letting the world know that Junkin is, in fact, the greatest show on earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. That's my only comment, and it's it's been very enlightening, um, Mrs. Ferguson. You gave them a good taste and a good inside look. Thank you. As to what the greatest show on earth really is and where it takes place. Yes. Just, 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 just um for your thank you, Angelique, and just for your information, just to say 
Angelique uh, created a group called the Junkanoo Commandos. And they, their mission is to carry Junkanoo around the world. And they have performed in all parts of the world carrying the message of Junkanoo. We salute, we salute her work and her vision. And, uh, you know, it has really been a, a, a privilege to have her and all of these other creative young people uh, uh, in this in this this morning. Well, right, thank, thank you. you. Over to you, Alexis. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, our Zoom family, <laughs> our YouTube family. And there was no questions on YouTube, but just to let everyone know, that this presentation will be there so that it can be shared and watched by everyone um, and hopefully more of our students will watch it. Um, thanks again so much, Mrs. Arlie Nash-Ferguson and Mr. David Brown. Um, the time difference as well in the Bahamas, Mr. Brown is not in Jamaica currently. So he, he as well is traveling and we just really appreciate everyone taking out um, their time today out of their very busy schedules for this presentation. And as um, was said by Angelique, it is the greatest show on earth. I fully <laughs> have bought into that tagline. And it really also ties into the title of our present, um, our lecture, which is Kaleidoscope of Creation. Creation, right. To really see that from the presentation, the pictures, I mean, again, I'm very ready to come and participate um, and be a part of that kaleidoscope um, and make the t-shirts of the kaleidoscope with me in it. Yes, yes. Um, so again, I appreciate it. Thanks again um, to everyone at National Museum Jamaica, my director, jo Dr. Jonathan Greenland for allowing us to have this presentation it has really enriched all of us. And again, I'm just putting it out there too. Just like how you have enriched us, we are very willing as well to do a presentation on John Kuno in Jamaica mm -hmm. for um, our Bahamian students and Jamaican mm -hmm. students as well. Yes, yes. So again, we're very, very open for further collaborations <coughs> and further mm -hmm. presentations. So thanks everyone. Be safe. And again, God bless. All right, bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Again. Mr. Brown. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.